I like when we start. Can you keep clapping? Like, this is a perfect beginning <laughs> to a wonderful <laughs> night. You guys, hi. Hi. How are you? Hi, Hoda. We're doing great. These guys are terrific. By the way, they've been on a long book tour, but you guys have been rocking it. Now, mm -hmm. explain why you guys decided to collaborate together on this book. Whose idea was it? Both of our ideas, Mine. I guess. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> and she wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> she edited it, which is not easy uh, to have your mother, who is the boss lady uh -huh. of all of us, but also a librarian mm -hmm. edit your work. It wasn't easy. Is she tough? <laughs> She's tough. She's tougher than she looks. Is she? <laughs> <laughs> well, we uh, knew this was the perfect year, the centennial of the national parks. Uh, to write a book for children about our national parks. And also, we wanted to write a book for children uh, because so many children are looking down and there are a lot of statistics that aren't that great. This generation is outside less than any generation in history. It's crazy. And we need to get outside. And of course, parents need to put those devices down as well. So did, was that how? <laughs> <laughs> that means down. you. Yeah, we see you. you. <laughs> now, um, when you were a little girl, when you were growing up, Mrs. Bush, um, you were an only child. That's right. Um, what did you do for fun? What was like a fun day for you as a little girl? Well, I always played outside. I mean, your mother said go outside and you <clears throat> played out <clears throat> until she called you from the back porch that dinner was ready. <clears throat> so I was used to playing outside. Uh, that's what I did. And tell and she, I cried last night why? because she told it? these, you know, as an only child, yeah. I have a twin sister. Yeah. So I had this um, per playmate from the time I was born. Who happens to be here? Who's in here? The yeah, here. Where Barbara's is she? Here. Where is? Oh, there oh, she is. Stand yeah. up, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> up, up, up. She's humiliated. <laughs> Can't even see her. <clears throat> um, but talk about your solo picnic. Well, I wrote <clears throat> this in my uh, memoir about mother would pack a little lunch for me, a peanut butter sandwich and an apple or something, and I would walk by myself to a little triangle park that was really down the block. I mean, it was not like it was far away, and have a solo picnic. Just you? <laughs> yes. Yesterday, last night when she told me this, I cried. <laughs> well, I, was, I was like, what? It wasn't sad. I mean, there was nothing sad about it. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Stop crying. <laughs> but I did always want brothers and sisters. My mother had lost a few, my parents had lost a few babies, early miscarriages, and I knew it. And I knew that they really wanted children, and so I did too. And so that was always my wish on a star. That was your wish on a star? Yeah, for a brother or sister. Did you, I would imagine, <clears throat> knowing you and getting to know you through Jenna, you must have had a lot of friends. You seem like the type. I have a lot of friends, and that's, of course, what makes the difference, really, I think, for only children to have a lot of friends. I have many childhood friends that I've known my entire life that are still my best friends. Mm -hmm. In fact, four of them hike with me every year. We've hiked for 30 years uh, every year in a national park. Uh, they, none of them live in Midland anymore. Uh, none of us live in Midland anymore, but we get together. We were just together a couple of weekends ago at Wimberley on Cypress Creek. Uh, to float on the creek, but we hike together every year, so we make a point to get together. Let me, and those are the kind of friends that an only child makes, I think. Uh, will you describe for me, someone asked me this question, and I thought it was telling. Close your eyes. Can you do it? Yes. <laughs> Picture your childhood bedroom. Look around your childhood bedroom. Now open your eyes and tell me what you see. What was in there? Well, I had sort of a day bed uh, that was under the window in the front, and I had my animals lined up in a row, my stuffed animals. Did that I And them? this is slightly compulsive, probably only child. They had to be lined up from the f largest <laughs> in the middle to the, and by the, to way, the this, smallest on the side every night before I went to this bed. This is the mother that on Saturday mornings while we were teenagers, which... We weren't the most pleasant teenagers, <laughs> I will admit it, would say, girls, it's a beautiful day, the perfect day to clean out your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what no teenager wants to hear. Did you have posters up on the wall? I didn't have posters, yeah. I don't think. Not as a child. And you were all neat. Everything was, uh, everything I was, was all orderly. Mm -hmm. Very You're orderly. You're so different than your daughter. <laughs> I will, let me tell you, I get to work Jenna with Jenna actually a lot. is a lot like me. She is? She did. She will admit it. I'm, I, this is the thing. What? My purse is my one bad spot, but I'm a neat freak at home. 
I know I hate to do this because, and I'm I also spill on myself a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and pins explode on me on every airplane ride I'm on. And I have pin mark all over my hand uh -huh. <laughs> right now. So we do, we compare, Hoda and I like to compare stains <laughs> on our dresses before we go on live television. Yeah, <laughs> whenever we co-anchor, we count them out. Usually <laughs> we debate who has more and who has less. When you were a little girl, did you know what you wanted to be, what you wanted to I knew to from do? the second grade I wanted to teach. My se I love my second grade teacher. She lived down the street from me. She rented a house, in fact, from my parents. And I wanted to be just like her. Mm -hmm. And I remember standing on the schoolyard and um, when we played outside during recess, and I would lean against her and she'd have her hands around me. And my best friend would lean against her teacher, Miss McQuestion, <laughs> and we would be eye to eye and they would be eye to eye. And oh. uh, I stayed friends with her for the rest of her life. When, when you told your parents, did you say to your mom and dad, I want to be a teacher? Yes, and I taught my dolls all the time. You did? Yes. And I did the same. You did? I taught my dolls so much my mom was worried about me. What do you mean? <laughs> she, well, you can explain. She just had such fantastic happenings with her <laughs> dolls that well, I wondered if maybe she was too fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> like something weird was going yes. on? She thought that I needed to go to a child psychiatrist. No, I did not. I learned that later. She <laughs> sure did. You did? No, I didn't. She read an article about Toni Morrison that said, that her mother said that Toni Morrison did the same thing. She created these epic stories with her dolls. What and kind she of thought, stories, Jenna, did you create? Well, there was, Barbara could probably say a little bit better, but there was definitely some divorce in there, <laughs> some drama. <laughs> it was sort of like Young and the Restless meets Kiwi's Playhouse. <laughs> and they were with Barbies, all with Barbies. She had a million Barbies. I still have them in a box. <laughs> the arms are missing. Of course they are. <laughs> Um, when you wanted to, you wanted an advanced degree, you wanted to go into library science. When you said to your parents, mom and dad, I want to get, I want to go on and get more education, what did your dad say? Of course he said yes. But I did at one time say, you know, you just programmed me to be a teacher. I should have been a lawyer. You should have said go to law school. And he almost got out his billfold to say, I'll send you to law school. And then, of course, I thought, well, I don't really want to go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm perfectly happy teaching. We're, and I really was. I loved teaching. I loved it. I loved working with kids. I'm amused by children. I like children. Um, I love teaching. And I still have a million stories. In fact, our first book, Read All About It, was based on one of my fourth grade classes that pretended like Charlotte had a web in the coat closet and Wilbur had a pen over here in the corner of the room so that even when it was not story hour and we weren't reading Charlotte's Web, they still pretended like Charlotte and uh, Wilbur were right there in the room. I think it's so fascinating. You're, when you talk about your stuffed animals and the way you like everything <laughs> just so, you seem like your life's really you know, orderly, you have your stuff together. So I think you were 30 and you get set up on a date with a boy named George and you meet him and three months later, we married. You got married. That's that right. seems so crazy for someone who likes something just so. Well, I think well, it was like we'd known each other our whole lives. George, had, the Bushes had lived in Midland until we were in the eighth grade. And we went to two separate um, elementary schools, but one year together in junior high. And we didn't really know each other, but we had all the same friends. Okay. All those friends that I'm still friends with were his, his friends too. So it was like we'd grown up together, although we didn't really know each other. And he went to Andover time. and Yale. Well, he, they left, went to Houston, yeah. <laughs> and then he moved back to Midland after he graduated from business school. Did your parents say, like, what do you think? <clears throat> no, no, no. They were they thrilled. Thought it was, they, they were thrilled. How come? And in fact, my friend, one of my great friends that I'm talking about that I hike with every year, was selling her house in Austin. And a friend of a woman that we knew, whose children also lived in Midland, came to look at Reagan's house to buy it. and. Reagan said, we're going to Midland this weekend for Laura and George's wedding. And she said, yes, can you imagine the most eligible bachelors marrying the old maid? <laughs> oh, what? We're, of course, exactly the same age, but he was eligible and I was the old maid. That is so <laughs> crazy. That's so Midland. Did you? Did and it was so the times, yeah. really. Did you know you were marrying a politician when you married him? <clears throat> That's why I hadn't really, for a couple of years, our friends who invited us both over for dinner at the same time had been saying they wanted to fix me up with him, and I thought I just wouldn't be interested. I knew his dad had run for Senate in Texas and for Congress, was elected a U.S. congressman, but lost a Senate race twice. 
So I knew that it was a political family and that he was, George was probably interested in politics. Uh -huh. But, um, he and promised I thought I her, wouldn't be interested. He promised her that she would never have to give a speech, a political speech. <laughs> uh, how'd that go? <laughs> Not very well. <laughs> when was your first one that you remember? The right away, speech? right after it we was. married. <laughs> <laughs> He decided to run for Congress. <laughs> so what, what, what did you feel like when you stepped up to speak? What was well, that it like was the in, first time? it was in um, our, the district in Texas. My grandmother had lived in, in Lubbock and Midland on the south. And so it was really home to me. And it was very nostalgic to drive up and down that district in West Texas. It bordered New Mexico on the side. And, you know, make that drive that I'd made a hundred times with my parents driving to Lubbock to see my grandmother, and so I loved it. I liked all of it. It was really fun. It was really a great way for us to get to know each other. He drove. It wasn't like we had drivers or anything. And you just talked just, all the yeah, way? Yeah, we talked all the time. So it was really a And great she says that, I don't, half the things that I say my mom said, she's like, I, we didn't do that. <laughs> so t true or false, she said that the first year of marriage, he spoke in rhyme the what? entire time. George was kind of nervous about well, he being was, married. No, he was madly in love. I think he was like, la la bara. You know, the no, one you're just like crazy in like love. That, but... oh, well, that's what the daughter interpreted as. That. <laughs> that's what you thought? <laughs> um, so when you, so how did you get over the nerves though? Because I think a lot of people, when they step up for the very first time and they have to face well, a, I was a big nervous. group. Did you have any I tricks? had a very great beginning to the speech, but then I hadn't really written the rest of it, so <laughs> sort of fell off to nothing. The secret to giving a good speech is having a good speech. Uh -huh. Having it written already. Did you know you, you always wanted kids? Yeah, of course. I really wanted children. Yeah. We, in fact, George and I had gone to the adoption, the famous adoption center in Fort Worth, the Gladney home, when we got pregnant with twins. How you were trying really hard before. Yeah. The day that working. she, I have this picture framed of my parents from, I guess, it was 1980, yeah. um, in in Mila's nursery, and it was the picture that they had sent to the Gladney home to try to adopt children. So the day they found couple, out she you know, was- Looking so longingly at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> the day that they found out that they were accepted to adopt kids was the day she found out she was pregnant with us. What, what did it feel like in that moment when you got the news that you were pregnant? I was thrilled. And then we had a sonogram and this wonderful doctor, doc, uh, Indian woman, Dr. Serini Malini said, oh, there are two babies. <laughs> and we gasped. And I'd sort of been picturing two babies, so I was so thrilled to get two at once. And so she said, they're beautiful babies. They're beautiful babies Aww. in the sonogram. And then I never saw her again. I always thought of her again. And then finally, I invited her to the state dinner for the prime minister of India. <laughs> Are you kidding? And she was at my table across going, <laughs> oh, that is so beautiful. The day she said, I never told anyone. I protected patient confidentiality. <laughs> oh, my God. Jenna's crying. And of course. <laughs> I haven't even said anything. And I'm, usually I make myself cry. <laughs> um, when, you, when, when the girls were born, Barbara and Jenna, and the very first time you held them, after that longing and wanting and wishing and, and even possibly adopting, what did it feel like to have them on your on your chest? Oh, it was wonderful, really. Uh, You're going to make it. her Although, cry. <laughs> I just wondered. Yeah. Although we didn't really know what to do with two babies. <laughs> <laughs> we'd put them in their cribs and they'd cry and we'd run to the other side of the house. <laughs> Hope they would quit crying and go to sleep. <laughs> were their personalities different from the from the jump, from the get-go? Yeah, a little bit, I think. I mean, they were each themselves, for sure. And, of course, I was thrilled to have two at once because they had each other. They were born with a sister, hmm. uh, which is what I had always wanted, the, mm -hmm. the sister or brother. So that was great. And during that time, you have two babies. What was your husband doing at that time? Was he, he in the office? He would, no, he was in the oil business in Midland. Business. We were, my parents lived there. We were in our hometown, which was great. I'm so happy that we had those years then. Uh, my dad loved children and he was so crazy about Barbara and Jenna. And every day, right after lunch, when I'd put them down for their nap, he would come stand at the door and talk real loud and say, Laura, are the babies awake? <laughs> <laughs> and then when he walked in their room, they'd be standing in their cribs oh. waiting for him. And um, so I'm so happy that he had the 
chance to have those babies in the same town for and those few years. You named Jenna after your mom? My mother, and then obviously Barbara's Barbara. named after George's mother. Is, is your mom still living? Yes, yeah, she's 96. She's wow. still in Midland. I wow. go to see her often. <clears throat> when, when do you think she was the proudest of you? Of all the things that have happened in your life, is there a time that you say that was the moment where I think my mom was the proudest of me? I think she was always proud of me. I mean, I didn't do anything. I just was along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> she did she a lot. She could be proud for, of, of George, which I'm sure she was. But um, I think she, al she always acted like she was proud of me, and she always acted like she was proud of Barbara and Jenna. Who, who was the disciplinarian of you and your husband when it came to the girls? Neither. That was the problem. <laughs> what? That was the problem. <laughs> they were just, they, they did, my dad probably. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the one time we got into trouble, or we got into it twice, but the one time my dad was president and I thought, oh no. I'm gonna have disappointed him so badly, and I felt terrible. Well, and I, what did you do? I don't remember. Well, I got. It's not worth getting into the details. <laughs> <laughs> you can probably. I had, you it. can probably look it up and, <laughs> and it. look right. it up on Star Magazine. <laughs> um, and I remember, you know, my dad had just been elected president. I thought, oh, I'm gonna. And this is the type of trouble that kids in college get, and it wasn't anything horrendous, right. thank goodness. Um, and I remember call, thinking, oh, I'm gonna have disappointed him so badly and I had to call him at you know 11 30 at night or something and he answered and it's an hour later in DC and I thought oh and he said honey are you okay and I said well dad I just got in trouble and he said well no are you okay it didn't even it was more you know he knew that we were wanted to be normal college kids and this yeah. is what normal college kids do they fall they make mistakes yeah and he wanted us to learn from those and I really think so I mean I think he thought more you know Geez, we put you in this situation to be plastered on the cover of t Today's Show. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, You're thank welcome. you, thank you, You're Hoda. <laughs> so you're a little girl, Jenna. You're growing up. You have a, an awesome sister. And what's it like to be a twin? What, what? Tell me what that feels this like. This is like therapy. This is what Barbara and I do when we go on speeches together. We just cry on stage <laughs> for 30 minutes. We're like, thank you so much for having us. We feel so much better about our lives. <laughs> Next time a couch would be appreciated. <laughs> Don't you sort of feel like hooking a therapist? Um, we, whatever, I mean, I can't imagine a day in my life that Barbara wasn't in it because there wasn't one. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I don't know if you guys have read the beautiful article she wrote in Vanity just Fair. Of that. I sent it oh. to Hoda and I read it to Henry and I cried while I was reading it to Henry. I'm like, isn't this beautiful? <laughs> Barbara's a really terrific writer and um, she's just such a, I have the best sister in the world. She's this beautiful spirit who uses her life to make others better. Mm -hmm. And so it's made my life really wonderful. And we compliment everybody. You know, it's one of the things about being a sibling or being a, a twin in particular is that people want to categorize you as, mm -hmm. or stereotype you. You're the blonde one, she's the brown one. <laughs> you know, she, you're the wild one, she's the calm one. And I actually think um, we complement each, that none of those stereotypes are perfectly correct. Right. And that we complement each other uh, perfectly. Mm -hmm. That every, you know, we laugh at the same things. We laugh at, our humor is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, we can tell when each other feels like they need uh, one mm -hmm. another. Oh. Is she <laughs> Barbara's gonna come up here and give you a hug in about one second. Barbara's sobbing. Too. She's right there, I sobbing in the white Good. shirt. Yeah. <laughs> she, so this you is what we know. How did you, by the way, how, you guys obviously are so normal. And Jenna, we knew you were, and you came, you came to us at the Today Show, which I'll get to, but you seem like you could have grown up in a small town on a block with your mom and dad, and you would have been this exact same girl. Given well, she did. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Given everything that you that was around you, and I'm sure the pressures that came with it, whether you you know say it, talk about it a lot or not, that's a lot of pressure for a young kid to have. I think. Well, I mean, we were t raised in Midland, Texas, till we were five. Yeah. We moved to D.C., where our grand my grandfather was running for for um, president. president. 
We lit, went to a, a darling little, I have such fond memories of our little public school in Washington, D.C., and our grandparents babysat us. Like, they babysat us a lot uh -huh. when my parents would go on date night, I guess. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> Including the night before my grandfather's debate versus Michael Dukakis, there was this famous, hilarious story where Barbara and I are spending the night with him, and she lost her cat, Spiky. <laughs> and my grandfather's hunting with the Secret Service instead of preparing for a debate. <laughs> She's like, can't be, I can't sleep without my stuffed animal. Oh, it was stuffed. It's oh, stuffed. I, no. oh, no, no, it wasn't a real cat. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't bring the real cat to the, to the vice president's house. We, it was fake. Um, but she, and I think that's it. I think uh, that we had grandparents that babysat us the night before debates mm -hmm. that put family above politics all the time mm -hmm. um, and made us feel like we were loved, that going back to that phone call, you know, they wanted us to grow into be, people always thought, oh, your parents, you know, you want you to be in one political party or the other, they want you to turn into this person or that person, and I think good parents, I mean, I hope that I can emulate this, want you to be creative, um, curious thinkers and to create your own opinions and have fun conversations around the dinner table. And that's what my parents mm -hmm. did. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> when it came to, how often did, did Jenna or Barbara ask for your advice? Or did they just watch what you did and sort of, you know, sometimes you ask for advice and sometimes you sort of just emulate your parents. I don't remember I'm asking for a lot of advice, do you? No. I really I think don't. Uh, I think bar I think we've asked for career advice. I know my sister, she started this amazing global health non-for-profit called the Global Health Corps. Um, she and one of her partners, Denny, are over there right mm -hmm. now. And she, I know that she spent long conversations with my mom and my dad, both about starting um, something from scratch and how difficult that can be. My work is just hanging out with Hoda. So <laughs> 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 and my mom does give me unsolicited advice, like, lower your voice. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you don't need to get so excited. No, I never said that. But you know what is funny? Jenna does reveal a lot on the show, and sometimes... But, and it's all fake. No, it is it, not it, fake. <laughs> what? It is not fake. She says this. This is what my... The other day when I was like, and we were on... Going back to the book. Oh, yeah. Part, yeah you know, <laughs> why we're here. Part of it was based on this rafting trip, and I'm like, I remember this sandstorm, and you had goggles on, and we brought out a bottle, te a bottle of tequila, and she's like, we did not bring out the tequila. And I'm like, Mom, yes, we did. She's like, no, we didn't have tequila. So what, did we figure out the truth of that tequila story? I think there was tequila there. <laughs> But nobody She claimed she it. didn't drink it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I maybe drank it, but she didn't drink it. Okay. Okay, let's get back to the, to the Grand Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> back to the, but real quick, one of the things Jenna said, I mean, very revealing, but little bitty things. And I remember every time Jenna hosts with me, it's always something that's cool and interesting. But I remember one thing you said that stuck with a lot of people. You said that you found your diary from when you were in fourth grade. Mm. And one of the things Jenna wrote in her diary as a fourth grader was, I want to lose four pounds. I want to go on a diet. You know how kids are very self, you don't even realize it broke my heart. Up. And you know what's even more um, sad about the story is that I wasn't the first person that found it. A couple years before, Barbara found it <laughs> at the ranch and it broke her heart so much. She had to just put, she like couldn't even come in and share it with us because she was devastated. Because she imagined my little chubby 10 year old self <laughs> saying that I wanted to lose six pounds. So she just put it back in the drawer and pretended <laughs> like she never read it. I know that, wow. You know when you've seen something so sad, you're like, I can't even discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? Because did you even realize that as a, as, as a grown woman? Do you remember stuff? like that or not? I mean, no. Barbara, do you remember me thinking, I was sort of chubby, but I kind of liked being chubby. Yeah. <laughs> and um, no, and the funny thing is like when we were trying to dissect, it's not like we talked about food a whole lot or my mom was definitely not, you know, the toddlers and tiaras type that was like, you know, lose weight for your bathing suit. <laughs> um, or, you know, so I don't know. It's just, I think that, and really what it, did was now that I have two girls, I think you have to be very careful about how you talk about um, beauty and yes. and all attributes. I mean, I, I, people will say, your daughter's so beautiful. And of course I say that too, and cute and all those words. But I try to describe my daughter and all of her friends as funny and creative and smart because, um, mm -hmm. you know, we don't want girls in particular to only think about the way we look. Mm -hmm. 
Is it true that you tried to set your sister up with <laughs> Harry during, a, during an interview on the Today Show? Do y'all want to hear a secret? Yeah. No, wait, I can't. Am I going to get in trouble if yeah, I say no. who texted? Somebody texted me yesterday. What? No, no. It was not Te Prince Harry. Jenna, <laughs> was it? No. no. Was it somebody affiliated with Prince Harry? Yes. <laughs> Is this going to happen? I don't know, but yeah. it could be. <laughs> Yes! <laughs> oh my gosh! Barbara's leaving over. Somebody texted you from that area. From, from that, that area. Region. Yes. And, and so it might be a setup? It could be. Okay. Jen, I am so happy. <laughs> <laughs> Can you even imagine your dinners? Yeah. Oh, it'd be so fun. My mom is. The thing is, it's not. it was a joke. It really was a joke. I didn't. I, I, I'm impulsive. Yeah. <laughs> and so I just spit things out, even in interviews, and I think that's part of what's fun about our job is yeah. that you can, and if you're secure enough in yourself, it's like, if it done work, who cares? <laughs> so I was just thinking it was hilarious because our, you know, producers were like, now ask him when he's going to have kids. And I'm like, y'all, he's, and he's single? Yeah. I'm like, th this is, don't you remember, I mean, this happened to me all the time. I would date Henry. When are you going to get married? We got married. When are you having children? I had one child. Child. When are you having the next? <laughs> Somebody asked me today, when's the next baby coming? I'm like, geez, can you give me a break? <laughs> <laughs> and I sort of felt like all the buzz around the interview was like, now ask him when he's going to have kids. And I'm like, well, wait, don't you think it's hilarious? So yeah. I just said, don't you think this question's so funny? Because he was getting it from everybody. And what did it, yeah. And he said, yeah, I mean, I'm single. And that's when you said it. I couldn't help but blurt out. <laughs> <laughs> I have a single sister. <laughs> Which isn't really my style, is it? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> now, your, your hubby's here. Yes. Henry's in the house. Henry's your husband. in the Where house. Where is Henry? Right there, Henry. Hi, Henry. <laughs> okay, so meeting Henry, how did that come about? Um, we were set up by some friends uh -huh. uh, he, that were, you know, worked for Henry. And I was like, don't bring the old person to the party. <laughs> he's, he's a fair amount older than I am. Yeah, like two years. <laughs> <laughs> I love to say that. All right, so um, you met him, and, and what we did met you him, think? And First. I thought he was really cute. Yeah. And I actually said to Barbara, I said, of course the cute one has a girlfriend. Did he? Yeah, he had a girlfriend. Oh. And she wore a lot of pink. <laughs> um, and I just didn't. You know, so I thought, oh, we're, this isn't going to ever work. Um, but no, it was. <laughs> Your mom's dying. <laughs> Should we get back to the book? <laughs> oh, yeah, we are here to talk about this. And we will. We promise. We will. We, we, will. Will. we will. But just real quick, <laughs> how long did you date before he proposed? We dated for four years. And actually, a good tie back to the book is that he proposed uh, at a national park. Oh. One of the things I love about Henry is he, one of the things my mom loves most about him, you can say it because you're proud of him. He's an Eagle Scout. <laughs> <laughs> is he really? He's an Eagle Scout. Now he's really embarrassed. Now wow. I've humiliated everybody that I'm related to. Um, <laughs> my mother, my husband, and my sister, he's an Eagle Scout, and I loved that about him. Yeah. And I think my mom would pr probably rather us marry an Eagle Scout than a prince. Um, and yes, so, for sure. So he, um, he, we both, you know, fell in love with the idea of being outdoors. That was one of the things we loved about each other. And when he proposed, we were on a, a car trip in Maine, a road trip, and we were at, a, at Acadia National Park. And he had planned this all out, where he was going to propose on the top of Cadillac Mountain, which is actually the first place the sun hits the United States because oh it's the farthest gosh. east place in our country. Um, and so he, he drove um, up and woke me up. We were camping out early in the morning, and he at four in the morning said, okay, come on, we got to go if we're going to, you know, it's a four-hour hike if we're going to get to the top, and I was grumpy probably, and we, um, like, one more hour. Um, but when we made it to the top, he proposed, and I remember, you know, thinking the night before we were writing in our journals, and I remember hearing little kids and thinking, you know, creating a life with him would be pretty great, and it has been. Eight years later, our anniversary was yesterday. Oh, happy <laughs> anniversary. And two adorable babies. And two babies. You have to see when Jenna works with me in the morning, how she comes in and does a little FaceTime with, mm -hmm. with Mila every morning. Mm -hmm. What's it like having those two, oh, those two little girls? They're the best. One of the really great things about technology, getting back to the book, <laughs> <laughs> is that we can FaceTime with Mila and Poppy every day. Yeah. So they see George and me every day, so they know us and, uh, because 
we're in Texas, they're up here, and we don't see them for a month or so at a time usually. And we can FaceTime every night with Poppy and Mila before they go to bed, which is really fun. Did you guys take road trips as a family? Did you pile in the car and do anything like we that? We drove to our lake house in East Texas. We didn't really take, we went to Maine in the summer. Well, we did, we would go to every weekend. I mean, I think part of the reason we wrote this book is that we didn't, you know, it doesn't need to be grand, these trips. We wouldn't go, we went to one national park and we lived in Midland. We went to Big Ben or the area around it. We rode a horse for the first time, but when we were, um, when we were little, we would go to this little cabin outside of Dallas in East Texas. And I remember when we got it, we thought, oh, awesome. We're gonna get to swim and water ski. And we were really little, we couldn't have water skied, but you know, all these activities. Well, there were alligators in the lake. <laughs> so it was really only for fishing and kind of walking around and being outdoors. Yeah. There wasn't much for, for a little um, second graders to do. So what we did was be, we played outside all day my sister and me and then also we would go on these night walks after we cooked my dad would say now who wants to go on a walk uh. and we most of the time we'd all raise our hands but you know I always felt like if I was lucky I'd have his undivided attention and I think that's one of the scary things about technology is that even you know in our own living rooms or or when we would go on night walks how many times would somebody look out check who text messaged them yeah. or look at their Instagram or you know, write a work email or get a phone call, but we never had that. So these were uninterrupted moments with each other that felt really precious. And George is really good about doing things like take, going on snow walks in Midland when they were little at night. Mm -hmm. We'd bundle up and walk in the streets with the, uh, with the street lights sort of reflecting in the snow on the mm -hmm. ground. Our, Camping out in the front yard of Walker's Point in Maine, <laughs> Gampy would always put up a tent, and then little Barbara and Jenna would sleep out there with George till probably about ten o'clock at night. And they'd have <laughs> Everybody to come in. But and it doesn't that that's why the book ends yeah. with the kids in their own backyard and thinking, "Wow, it is pretty beautiful." right here. Um, you know, going around our country is spectacular and we're so happy to partner with the National Parks Foundation because we love these places and we want them to stay protected. But at the same time, you know, the, our trips weren't grand. They were setting up a tent in the front yard <laughs> or going on night walks. All right, the questions, questions are coming in fast okay, and good, furious. Great. Oh. oh, there's just <laughs> one. Please give back the questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Alrighty then. <laughs> I know. Sorry, your questions no, were good enough. No, your questions <laughs> did not pass the test, okay? Um, all right, so um, let's talk just, just quickly about, we have to talk a little bit about politics today. It's a we little, do? Well, if you, do you want to? No. You don't? No. <laughs> Nobody wants to? No, we, we don't, don't have talk to. About we can talk about exactly what we want to talk about. No, yeah, that's right. No. <laughs> no, that's a no. Okay, that's a no. No, Jenna? Uh, well, I shouldn't. We don't have to, don't, don't. Okay. Jenna doesn't we'll, have to talk. She's a member of the press now. Yeah, you're right. You know what? You can always be Use that excuse. That's exactly what you that's such a good do. one? Yeah, mm -hmm. that is what you I'm a member of the do. press. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sorry, Hoda, I can't discuss it. I'm a member of the you press. Would. What was it like, talk about living in the White House for a second, because I think for a lot of us, it, you peek in the windows and you wonder what life's like. I love what you said today, Mrs. Bush, you were like this, I'm so happy to be in flats. I stopped wearing heels once I left the White House. <laughs> yeah. Like such, but what was life like there? Well, life was actually very normal there too. Was it? Um, we knew everyone that worked there, the, all the people that work at the White House are permanent. The, the butlers, the ushers, the gardeners, the, uh, chef, everyone that works there. And so, of course, we knew them all because we'd visited the bushes so often. We'd stayed in the Lincoln bedroom. We'd stayed in the Queen's bedroom. We, um, at night, uh, Bar Bush and I would walk around downstairs after all the crowds had left, the tours had left, and we'd look, stand in the red room and look at it or move to the green room and look at the green room. So we really did have a lot of experience with the White House, and it was a huge advantage for us. Not only that, I had Barbara Bush to learn from yeah. and to watch uh, the whole time. So I knew a lot. I mean, I remember when President Bush started to run for president, she had this talk with me and she said, I'm gonna focus on literacy. Hmm. She said, because if you can read, your advantage over non-readers is so huge 
that um, you know everyone should learn to read. And I remember having the, the discussion with her on what she would work on if he was elected, hmm. which of course is what she did. But um, so that was a huge advantage for us. We really did feel at home right away as soon as we got there. You had a connection with the, you've had a connection with the women of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And I was reading something, uh, an interview with you years ago, and you, and I think this was right, you were in like sixth grade or something. That's and right. With your dad. And My sixth grade report was on Afghanistan. How did that come to be? Why? Well, you just, why? we just picked a country. It was sort of a, I guess we just got to pick whatever we wanted to pick. And I picked Afghanistan because it seemed so remote and exotic and far away and of course never dreamed that I would actually go there or that it would play so prominently in, in uh, my life. Mm -hmm. And I have another new book. I know we're here to talk about this one, but I was on a book tour recently for We Are Afghan Women, a book that mm -hmm. the Bush Institute published with the stories of 28 Afghan women, which is very interesting. Their stories are it really tells the history of Afghanistan for the last 40 years from when the Russians went in till when they went out. And then that left the big vacuum with the Mujahideen fighting each other, these militias that had formed to run the Russians out. Mm -hmm. So, um, and these women lived through this. They would go off and to, they'd cross the border and be in Pakistan or they'd go cross the border and go to Iran. Or, or one woman and her husband would leave their house every night and sleep in the mountains for two years. Oh my God. They did it because they were afraid of the Taliban or the Russians when they were there. I mean, it's really had quite, a, quite the history. But women in Afghanistan are feeling better. We, Mrs. Ghani, the new first lady of Afghanistan, has been to, to visit us twice uh, in, uh, at, in Dallas. Uh, she's a member of the U.S. Afghan Women's Council that was founded right after September 11th. And then we just had the new ambassador from Afghanistan to the U.S. and his wife to lunch at the Bush Center. And George said, tell us, what, how do people feel? Mm -hmm. And he said, good, and that things are good. You know, they're better than we think reading things. But he said people are afraid. Hmm. And, you know, I know they are. I mean, I know he thinks we should stay there, that our troops give them the security that they need to be able to build the institutions they need to build mm -hmm. that um, will support their democracy, the institutions that we inherited, all the things we inherited that we didn't have to do a thing for, mm -hmm. the free press, the independent judiciary, the business law, the contract law, all the things that we inherited that allow us to have a thriving economy and, and build are the civic institutions and civil institutions that support a democracy. Mm -hmm. You stay involved in everything. Is, is it weird once you leave the White House because now you're ha you know everything. You want to help to change. Well, so that's many right. Things. I mean, you there's certain continue. things that you yeah. want to keep working on, and uh -huh. that's one for sure. And how did how did days unfold? Minus the book tour, forget this. Mm -hmm. Well, like, days were busy. Yeah. I mean, there was lots of travel. I went to every single state. I went to 46 countries or some no 76 what? countries. They've now been approved. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, every day you got up and got dressed and put on heels and went somewhere, <laughs> went you know, with events of, of various types or traveled all over the country mm -hmm. on a lot of things. I founded the two book festivals. The, I'd started the National Book Fest, the Texas Book Festival when George was governor. And, and uh, so as soon as we moved to the White House, the Librarian of Congress, Jim Billington, called and said, don't you want to do a National Book Festival? like that, and we had it, and it was the weekend before September 11th. Wow. But so it's there was continued a, today. Mrs. But it, Obama's goes, continued it still goes it. on today. 200,000 people turn out for it now. The first year, 30,000 people wow. turned out, and we thought that was a huge number. All right, we're going to get to some of these okay, questions. Good. We just have a few minutes, so hold on. I hope they're about the book. Let's see. <laughs> I think you might be right. <laughs> All right, good? this one says, what's the biggest discovery that you made while working on the book? Hmm, that's interesting. What would be the biggest discovery? Well, I think, you know, one thing it made us think about is that, you know, the whole point is that it's a book about a little girl named Jane who wants to go, her parents want to take her on the great American road trip. And all she wants to do is stare at a screen. 
Um, and I think, it, and I, the reason why we, I wrote it on maternity leave because I thought about my most fond memories and they were spent with outdoors with my parents and we didn't have technology to kind of impede on that. We didn't have a computer, I don't think until fourth grade. Um, and so when I thought, when I was holding this little baby, I got kind of worried. Like, yeah. what is their life going to be like? And that's um, new mothers, you know, are hormonal as can be. I still am, <laughs> as you can tell. And so you, you get very wrapped up in sort of like thinking about your children's future. I did. And I think, you know, that's the reason why we wrote it, because we want to make sure that this next generation doesn't get so caught looking down that they forget to look up. And so one of the things that it made us sort of do, and I'll let you speak for yourself, but is realize that we're the ones do looking the down same too. Yeah. And that, you know, some of my favorite, when we've talked about this book, I realized some of my other favorite memories with my dad in particular, and my mom too, but I don't, for whatever reason, maybe you would go out earlier to the lake and my dad would drive us. And Barbara probably remembers this. Is like, remember when we made Dad listen to the Green Day CD over and over and over again? <laughs> Was having these com where, these car rides where we could listen to music and talk about the music. And I have the type of dad that let us play DJ, which was very fun. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he didn't want to listen to Green Day, but he pretended he did. Mm -hmm. He's more of a Hank Williams <laughs> <laughs> senior type. But he, um, we'd had great conversations because there was nothing to distract us. Yeah. There was no TV screen, there was no phones. And so what it's made us think about is one, how much we're looking down and not paying attention to our children. Um, two, on car rides, Henry and I got into the habit where, you know, and I'll admit this, where sometimes it's easier just to give Mila the iPad and to watch Peppa Pig and, you know, and then it's quiet and we can talk. I mean, she is three, you know, but <laughs> we don't need to be so hard on ourselves. But, but how important is it to have those fun family conversations mm -hmm. or to sing along to music? Um, and so that's something that it made us think about is how often we're looking down mm -hmm. as adults. Okay. All right. Here's another one. You must have more uh, free time now. So what do you and the president enjoy doing in Dallas? Uh, well, George has become a painter. You probably know that. He's um, really having a wonderful time painting. He's gotten to be really good. Um, he spends a few hours every day painting, and he has two different instructors that are both artists uh, who are his instructors, so he loves that. Uh, he, we have a lot of mountain bike trails <clears throat> at our ranch, and he rides mountain bikes there. He's had a mountain bike ride in a golf tournament with Wounded Warriors every year. Uh, in Dallas, and we were just this weekend when Jenna was with Prince Harry <laughs> at um, the Invictus Games in Orlando, which um, was is for Wounded Warriors. It was founded by Prince Harry. He was he hosted it in Great Britain last year, and then this year he moved it to Atlanta. But it was all the warriors. Moved it to all, Orlando. Orlando, mm -hmm. all the warriors um, in the coalition that went into Afghanistan. So it was people from the Netherlands, from Great Britain, from Canada, from Jordan even, from Afghanistan, uh, from all the countries that were involved. I think about 14 or 15 uh, countries were represented there. So, um, so he's done a lot with Wounded Warriors. And right now, in fact, he's painting portraits of Wounded Warriors. Oh, wow. And he wants to do a book with the portrait and then he'll write the story of each of them. They're all men and women. Uh, that he knows. Wow, beautiful. Um, what is your favorite family vacation? Well, one, uh, did we already tell the story? Now we're like, we've talked so much, we don't remember what we've said and what we haven't. Did we tell the story of the Grand Canyon? Talk about hiking. No, we didn't really get in the details. Okay. Yeah, what happened? So uh, I've hiked, like I said, with the, these Midland friends that I grew up with for 30 years. And the very first trip we went on uh, 30 years ago was the Grand Canyon floating down the Colorado River and then hiking out the South Rim. So when we were at the White House, we thought one of those years that we would uh, do that same trip again in the Grand Canyon and invite our daughters to go. So we did. And uh, Jenna and all the girls, Barbara was in Africa at the time, so she didn't get to come with us, but um, made that trip together. The beautiful, beautiful Grand Canyon with these pristine little beaches along the side where you set up the tents at night, cook, and we use an outfitter, so they do all that. We always use an outfitter. Mm -hmm. We can't set up the tents ourselves. <laughs> 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 um, 
But anyway, that was the trip. And then, Jen but you and know, I they invited us once and they never invited us again. <laughs> I don't know what we did wrong. We shared a tent, and she every morning she'd say, "Pass me my contacts." Uh, yeah, she's exactly. Really, I wouldn't be able to find. She my couldn't contacts find it. Where are my? Blind. Do you see my contacts? <laughs> and then the sand would blow on these little sandy beaches, and so I wore goggles the whole time. I was a nerd <laughs> in the national parks. And I sort of led her around, <laughs> helping her from one place to the next. But we had a really terrific time. And that was one of our favorites. So we, of course, put the Grand Canyon in this one, mm -hmm. this I love book. That. Um, from whom did you discover the beauty of the outdoors? Was it your folks? Yes, yeah. I mean, oh, from yes, from my mother for yeah. sure. My mother was a real naturalist. She, when I was the Girl Scout and got we got our bird badge, she became a very knowledgeable bird watcher, which was kind of irritating when I was a teenager <laughs> and you'd be trying to sleep in the back seat of a car on a car trip and she would you know oh look there's a so-and-so and then guess bird. what our mom did when we were teenagers <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she's you know that so she was really the one she was the inspiration and part of the book the little girl's hesitant she says nothing to see here she's looking down at her phone she's not looking up meanwhile there are tons of animals yeah. tons of things around her and we she wakes up when her mom says put your phone down and come look in the telescope in Big Bend National Park, which is by where we grew up. And she looks up and she sees a meteor shower. And that's based on favorite childhood memories with our grandma, Jenna. Um, she would have us to her front yard and we, she would put, I remember what the blanket looks like. Do you remember the blanket, Barbara? It was this pink kind of soft blanket that was plaid, very, very 80s. And would put it on the ground, or maybe even more like very, very 50s. Yeah, a lot earlier. And put it on the ground, and we would lay and just stare at the stars. Mm -hmm. And that was enough. I mean, being there with her, mm -hmm. staring at the stars, was one of the most powerful memories of our childhood. Mm -hmm. And so in it, when you write your own book, picture book, you can put a lot of little things in it that you want to put in it. So in the telescope that Jane looks through are the initials JW, my mother's initials. Oh. Yeah, there's a lot of numbers. You'll notice 43 on the golf bags. <laughs> <laughs> it's all there. Enforcer on the, uh, um, at the Yellowst um, Yellowstone. That the geyser. The Old geyser faithful. has an enforcer on it. That's for our grandmother. And you'll notice a little white, our other grandmother, Barbara, uh -huh. the enforcer. Uh -huh. And you'll notice a little white-haired lady in the corner, and that's also her. <laughs> all clues all over. You guys, this was beautiful. Thank you, no, guys. Well, thanks, oh, thanks, thanks. Oh, 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 thanks.